I'm Kirk Harnack. On This Week in Radio Tech, we'll help you decide just when to hire that expensive engineer. All unbiased advice, of course. Chris Tobin, Tom Ray, Chris Tarr, and me are on Twert next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This Week in Radio Tech, episode 102, recorded October 12th, 2011. Okay, pay me later. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by the Telos Alliance and the astonishingly gorgeous Now Catalog, featuring color pictures, diagrams, techie specs, and many words of modern radio wisdom. Telos will mail it to you free, and you can download the PDF. Get yours at telosalliance.com slash now. Hello, it's time for This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host, and I'm really glad to be here. Hey, we missed you last week. It, it was a sad occasion, actually. It was the uh, the day that Steve Jobs uh, passed away, and so we weren't here with you. The Twit Network, uh, which uh, we're very proud to have as, as uh, the network that carries this show, uh, the Twit Network was uh, wall-to-wall with uh, coverage and um, uh, uh, memories of uh, Steve Jobs. But we're back this week, and we're very glad to be here and glad that you could join us. Our show, This Week in Radio Tech, is brought to you by Telos Systems on the web at telos-systems.com. I'm going to encourage you later on in the show to sign up for the free catalog from Telos. It is a gorgeous thing, a thing to behold, thing something you'll put on your coffee table and talk about it with your grandchildren. All right, joining me on this show, This Week in Radio Tech, where we talk about radio tech from the Hudson Valley of New York, please welcome my co-host, Tom Ray. Hey, Tom. Hey, good evening, Kirk. How you doing? I'm uh, VP Engineering for uh, Buckley Broadcasting and WR Radio in New York. And please excuse, there's a fly in here driving me out of my mind. Um, and, uh, you know, I was real excited today when I heard them uh, heard that the NFL set a date for the uh, Super Bowl that's supposed to be held out in, the, uh, out in the Meadowlands in 2014 for February 2nd. Until I realized it was Groundhog Day, so that means when the Giants come out of the stadium and see their shadow, there'll be one more game of poorly played football. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, I'm yes. I'm, so, I'm such a, a, a terrible sports fan. I'm going to have to have you explain that to me. But after the show, okay, we'll do that in the show. After the, show. <laughs> the Groundhog Day thing, I think I got. I was going to say, ask your sports guy at uh, Fox 17. Do yeah, show you I should I should do that. Sports yeah, sports he'll, he'll he'll take pity he'll on me. In a real hurry. <laughs> Hey, also joining us from the New York City area, from Manhattan, right at the, the heart of everything, uh, it's the best dressed engineer in radio, it's Chris Tobin. Hello, Chris. Hello, Kirk. Tom, I'm doing well. It's uh, president of Music Cam USA is what I do these days, and uh, we do IP codecs, so just for disclosure purposes, so there's no confusion there. And it's been a rainy day here in the Big Apple. It's just been really horrible. But uh, no football jokes, because baseball was a very poor, poor season. The Yankees just a bunch of overpaid buffoons, that's what I think. That's just my opinion. <laughs> hey, don't beat around the bush, man. Tell us what you think. Hey, and hey, you know, I wouldn't be have... a New Yorker if I did. <laughs> Chris, you and I really haven't discussed this much since your switch from uh, your former uh, place of employment, CBS Radio, to uh, CCS Music Cam USA. Uh, and right. uh, uh, hey, listen, feel free to inject uh, you know comments about the technology. You guys get it uh, as far as doing audio over IP, and you guys do some have some video products too. So obviously it's not a commercial, but when there's tech involved, hey, I, I know you'll you'll bring it up. And when you were at CBS Radio, you were the kind of guy that just brought to bear all different kinds of tech stuff that uh, left uh, some other engineers scratching their heads. What in the world is Tobin up to? And uh, and and you'd sometimes pull off an, an interesting uh, uh, remote broadcast or or uh, you know, some other tasks that had to get done using innovative technology. Also, I remember at our show that we did at the uh, at NAB um, on on the Twit Network here when we did our our Twit show from there. You uh, you you brought uh, brought to show and tell uh, a few items like that. So I'd, we'd love to hear more about that. Matter of fact, maybe we'll just do a whole show on on uh, how the video products over at uh, at, at Music Cam and, and you know how this is playing in and and, and working together. Would, would would you do that for us in some other future show? Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. It's actually, uh, it's interesting. Some of the video stuff is now getting a lot of uh, interest from the radio folks, believe it or not. it's uh, It's been fun. 
Well, you know, it's just radio with pictures, so it just makes Absolutely. sense. Absolutely. <laughs> Hey, also joining us from Maquanago, Wisconsin, it's Chris Tarr. Hello, Chris. He's the he's the engineer. Well, you know, I, I, the internet I don't think is ever going to catch on. I think it's just a passing fad. So you know, whatever. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I am the director of engineering for Intercom's radio stations in Madison and Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That is Wisconsin, home of the uh, the Packers, Super Bowl champions, which will be out there in 2014. Also, uh, soon to be, hopefully, Quiet, Chris. Uh, World Series Brewers. <laughs> And then, of course, yeah. the Wisconsin Badgers that are trouncing on everything. So, yeah, times are good here in Wisconsin. Chris Tarr is at geekjedi.com. I invite you to uh, to go there. And, uh, Chris, you and I were having a little offline conversation about uh, ninjas yesterday. That was pretty funny. Oh, yes, yes. What, like what, I said, you know, as a ninja, you'll, you'll, you know, I, I, I can see what you're doing. You just won't see me watching you do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. All right, let's let's uh, do a quick power round here. See what, if if you guys know anything about what is currently in the the headlines in the news. Give us a, your your uh, your opinion here, and we'll talk about it for just a minute before we get to our big subject of the day. Uh, item number one: FEMA. Everybody knows who FEMA is. FEMA is finalizing EAS best practices. By the way, the fodder for our discussion comes from the pages of RadioWorld.com. Check them out online because it's good stuff. Okay. FEMA finalizes EAS best practices like things like um, install the unit in the desired location. Okay. Uh, set for automatic or manual forwarding. If the facility is unattended, set to automatic. These are some of the best practices. So there's a step-by-step -step guide here in this article about how to set up your EAS uh, uh, basic installation and configuration. What do you guys think about best practices? This to me looks like a document that, okay, it's simple, uh, but it's there's probably steps here that some stations uh, left out of their EAS uh, install e equipment installation. Um, boy, this is this looks like required reading to me, and it's about time. What do you guys think? Well, I think so too. You know, well, because in some uh, instances, uh, you now let's face it, uh, EAS isn't uh, it, it isn't a money maker at the facility, and uh, it kind of gets put in the rack and kind of sits there and it's that thing that makes noise every so often and uh, you know we have to do the stupid test every week and push the button and um, you know I, I, I mean maybe at some point you need to tell people here's what you have to do um, and actually in some cases maybe the general manager knows what you need to do to put the thing in um, you know they don't install themselves they don't program themselves um, but it's required to, to be at your station you know, you, 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 you touch on a good point there. You said maybe the manager is putting this thing in. That's true. There's plenty of stations that uh, we're going to talk about this later uh, in this show that don't employ a full-time engineer or maybe even a contract engineer or don't bring them in when they should. The manager says, you know what? It's going to cost $300 to bring Chris Tarr in here to work for an hour. So I'm just going to hook this up myself. And lo and behold, then the EAS test uh, uh, likely doesn't work. Um, so so this, this best practices, uh, uh, Chris or Chris, you got an opinion about this? I do. I think the best practice is a good is a good start. Uh, as Tom pointed out, EAS is, if we want to say, not a money maker. It's not something that people focus on. And I've said in the past, you know, once EAS becomes part of the lexicon of how programmers do radio, you'll see much more proper use of it. But best practices makes the sense uh, makes sense because without that. Pretty much anybody at the station level, we'll just say non-technical, could just argue, well, I installed it. The rules say make sure it's there, it's in. That's about it. That's all I did. Whereas best practices at least takes it to the next level and says, yes, it's required by rules and regulations. And here's what you need to do to make sure that you meet those rules and regulations properly. So that when you do get cited, you can't sit there and try and you know, plead ignorance. Uh, it's a start. But this, you know, EAS is such a moving target in some markets and some places. It's, it's, it's it's going to be a while before people really get it down to just doing a regular routine install. But, yeah, station managers and stuff, this is definitely a way to go. You know, I, I think there's a, a lot of folks, a lot of radio engineers who uh, are, you know, kind of on the fence about about EAS. Okay, yeah, we recognize we're a, uh, we're, we're a you know, friendly licensed radio facility. We probably have some kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, obligation to, to public safety. And um, yeah, EAS is, is actually, I think, a pretty darn good way to, um, you know, I, I, for some stations, to absolve them of the, the, what could be an enormous responsibility of disseminating information and perhaps getting it wrong. And 
allowing the the local officials, uh, the the local emergency management agencies, to get the word out. So the, the and then it's on them to to get it right. It's on the station to disseminate it, which is what the station's good at. They've got the transmitter and the listeners. So um, yeah, you know, from that point of view, ES can can be a good thing. I'm just I don't know. I have such mixed feelings. It could work so well, and I've seen it just be disastrous so often. So you know, we we do what we have to do. We try to do it very well and make it reliable. Uh, not make it flaky at all, and then hope hope for the best. I, I you know I, I wish I could have a better attitude about that. But uh, <laughs> Knox Harrington in the chat room says the EAS sounds like you're getting facts. <laughs> I can't argue yeah. with that. So well, hey, we won't engineers, tell them what we actually call those things on the air. So <laughs> <laughs> something about a duck. Um, you got uh, it. Yeah, so uh, I would in encourage uh, everyone. I'm going to print this thing out. In fact, I, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to keep this up and I'm going to print it out. In fact, I may just hit print right now. Will this will this, will this kill my uh, my connection with Skype if I print this right now? Here we go. Kirk is is, is printing this document. Um, okay, I would encourage you to go to Radio World Online, RW Online, and uh, get. The, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, or, or RadioWorld.com will get it for you. RadioWorld.com and look at this headline, FEMA finalizing EAS best practices. There you go. And print that out and, hey, follow, follow the direction. Next story, patent office will re-examine patents. This has to do with uh, the patent and trademark office re-examining two patents at the center of that legal dispute between broadcasters, radio broadcasters, and a company claiming to own key automation technology. Um, broadcast Electronics, uh, which makes audio of all products. They're not a defendant in the patent infringement lawsuit. They had asked for the review and received word in mid-September that the patent office had granted the request. A favorable finding could render the lawsuit completely moot, uh, although that is not assured. We talked about this on a previous episode, uh, and this, this had to do with this, tech, this company claiming that they had a patent on having a computer network to play back uh, songs. Uh, and it's just, it, I don't know. I don't understand how pat patents are a, a, a pretty frequent subject on this network, on the Twit network. Uh, guys, do, do any of you want to take the position of the the, the patent holder and and defend that? I don't think so. Uh, from what I, I from what I know of patents and the few times I've been involved in some patents, you know, not disputes but discussions. Right now, the way the environment is uh, with people and patents, it's just basically come down to money-making um, um, proposition. Some of the patents that are, in our, that are being you know, argued, if you will, if you read them, and I've read a few of them, you know, it's all about pre-existing art, uh, pre-existing uh, technologies or, or application of it. Uh, is it something that you can actually patent when you think about it? Is it something that's used in everyday uh, use? I mean, some of these patents, it's, like, it's blatant that this is totally false. And yet, we have to go through this, this iteration. And this automation thing, I believe this came up about five, seven, seven years ago, where some people disputed automation delivery through uh, digital means and something else. And everyone's like, what? And it just disappeared for a while. Now it's come back again. So I don't know. I mean, I, I read a patent uh, two years ago. It used the word time warping. Okay, time warping. So let's look that up at the Smithsonian Institute or maybe <laughs> at uh, the, 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 what do you call the uh, Federation of uh, Scientists and say, okay, time warping. How do you apply that in the delivery of content? That's, that's what it was part of. They, this company had a patent on a time warping technique for shifting content. Okay? So how, 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 how in anyone's right mind can you sit there, read a document that has the words time warping, where you can't even scientifically apply it and, and get, it, get it passed through and accept that now all of a sudden you have a document the protection allows you to go after somebody who's doing a legitimate business deal because it's a normal evolution of technology to say record something and play it back later. And we uh, did but with cassettes. But back you just said a key phrase, Chris. You just said a key yes. phrase. Now with, with with this lawsuit, why are they not why are they going after the broadcasters? I mean, if you bought an automation system, you bought it in good faith from the company that made it. Exactly. Why are you on the hook? Why are you on exactly. the hook? For? I I don't get it. That's why I'm why saying not, this is very suspect, very suspect, why, and it why would really needs to be even, properly examined. Why, why would a court even consider looking at it? It's like... Well, here, here's, a, here's, a, here's another example of patents and how they're applied and whether you choose, or, you know, patents and licensing of technology. The touchscreen. If you use a touchscreen with certain 
technologies in the broadcast environment, I'll just simply put it that way, you need to pay a license if you choose to use it. If you choose not to, then you don't have to worry. Nobody's ever gotten on anyone's case about that. It's understood, and that's how it works. This whole thing, you know, and Tom is right, you're going after the broadcasters who purchased a product that we'll say is employing a technology that maybe allegedly is being accused of infringing on a patent. So why would the end user be the one you hold responsible? Or do we use the same example as used for people drinking at a bar and you hold a bartender responsible? Or do you go after the beer manufacturer? Maybe you do gun controls and you do the same thing with, you know, with the guns. I mean, think about it. I mean, let's be, you know, common sense here. It's just my opinion. <laughs> Well, there, there has been a search for uh, prior art. Uh, in fact, it seems like I've seen a, a couple of industry uh, newsletters about this and, and maybe even got a, a phone call. Uh, had a conversation with the owner of uh, one of the, the big digital automation companies. And he said, oh, there's, there, there's prior art. Uh, yeah, I, I've got prior art. Uh, the, in, the, in the Radio World article, uh, there's uh, uh, Randy Stein uh, is responsible for this uh, sidebar. Um, and he interviewed, uh, has an interview here with uh, uh, Ron Paley, Ron W. Paley, uh, with uh, Oakwood, and uh, they also had a company. It uh, was um, uh, mm -mm -mm -mm, Oakwood Audio Labs. Oh, and Media Touch of Salem, New Hampshire, um, and and they had uh, a networked audio system playing songs in uh, at least in '93, which is prior to yeah. the '94 uh, date of uh, of this. Uh, uh, Ron says uh, our Media Touch automation system featured uh, 4,000 plus music cuts in Dolby AC2. File server stored, played to air over a network, servicing multiple radio stations, air studios simultaneously, and all fully functional in a mission critical environment. Uh, this was designed in '92, installed in a broadcast facility uh, that was a super duopoly back then in the spring of '93. So anyway, uh, uh, and I rem I've, I've met John Connell. I'm not sure. I, yeah, I've met Ron Paley too, but I've also met uh, John Connell uh, when um, yeah when he was still operating uh, Media Touch. Had dinner with him at NAB, and that had to be in the very early 90s, 92 or 3 or so. Yeah. So anyway, I don't know. I, this, 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 this will go away. I, it just seems like such a waste of time. You know, uh, Kirk, what, uh, mm -hmm. what I find even more interesting is I, I uh, stumbled across a, uh, a PowerPoint presentation the other day that was doing it. Well, we'll get uh -oh, Tom back we'll in, in just a minute. We'll get Tom back in, in just a minute. Um, uh, Chris, yeah, uh, is, is, is Chris Tar back? Is it just is it me and Tobin? All right. I guess so. I guess so. I'll All tell right, you what, you let's not be, I don't want to beat this dead horse in, 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 in any farther. I'm curious about this story from uh, Radio World. Univision tells DAR.FM, it's a website, DAR.FM, oh, to pull its stations off their website. The radio recording service, DARFM, DAR.FM, isn't happy about receiving a cease and desist order from Univision, Univision which claims that time-shifting radio is copyright infringement. DARFM's Michael Robertson says that while tech recording broadcasting material may be new to radio, it's not new to society. Nearly 50% of U.S. households have a DVR, which records broadcasts. Uh, and the letter from Univision's law firm, um, law firm uh, McDermott, Will, and Emery, attorney Jorge Ars Arseniga, states that by allowing for permanent downloads of MP3 recordings by subscribers, the DARFM website is essentially opening the door for users to engage in copyright infringement, since unlimited copies can be made from downloading the MP3 and distributing to others. Uh, well, okay, and these songs aren't really in the clear, are they? Aren't they? They're, they're, aren't they? they're part of what, they're, what the radio station's doing. Uh, that might not make a difference to some people. Cease and desist. Would, uh, you guys have an opinion about this, about this time-shifting service, DARFM? Uh, I read about it uh, about a week ago in um, I think Wall Street Journal had had a quick article on it. I, you know, work I I can say that working at some networks in the past and being part of a distribution chain for syndicated programming um, back in the day, something like this would be frowned upon. But I'd say in the last couple of years, I'm more of the mindset that you know if I can get my stuff out there and it's done in a proper manner, you know what. Let's make it happen, and we'll work on monetizing it internally and do other stuff and get our stuff in front of people. You know, five, ten years ago, the distribution channels were very limited, and you could probably wait, you know, run around screaming, hey, you can't be doing this, this is bad. But today, you know, you pick up your phone, you, know, you got the little device here, this is it, this is your connection to your audience, why deprive them? They'll go elsewhere.
I mean, look at Beck. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, Jeff, uh, what do you call Glenn Beck has moved off of television onto IPTV because of a lot of, you know, concerns about, the, you know, his attitude's one thing, but distribution and this and that and got to have better control. Yeah. What does it get you? Hello? You're no longer in the mainstream. Good, so, good I, point. You know, Univision, good point. Uni Univision yeah. I understand where they're coming from, but they should really take a step back and say, hey, what do we have? Is it, is, are people downloading our stuff? I'd say yes. And, and downloading how much of it? A lot. Okay, that means there's value. Yeah, well, I want to keep the value. No, that's fine. Go ahead and continue selling it, continue promoting and do what you're doing, but know that folks are grabbing it and using it. So you embed your, your value in the program. Maybe go back to the old days of doing sponsorships within the program, not just breaking it out as 60s and 30s and 10s. You know, I, I just, I think the RFM, I've used it. It's actually pretty cool. Um, but uh. I really think that... Uh, Broadcasters or content providers need to rethink stuff. I really, I mean, a perfect example, this network and what we do here. You know what? You can find it on how many platforms, how many devices, oh my goodness. how many formats, yeah. right? Now, is there a burden? Absolutely. Has Leo mentioned on many occasions that there's a, there's a cost involved? Absolutely. But like I always tell people, that's the cost of doing business. Your goal as a business person is to find a way to offset the money coming in to the money going out for expenses and make a margin that is, you know, acceptable by all those participating. I think that's a pretty simple principle. And yet, there are several, com you know, dozen companies that are multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar enterprises that seem to have an issue with that. Can't seem to get, get their heads around it. So, uh, yeah, the Dar FM, my opinion, just continue on. Content providers, whatever you're doing, capitalize on what you got. Do it right, and you'll, you'll see the money. It'll come in. Jerry yeah, Seinfeld okay. did it. You can do it. I've got a follow-up question to your, your statement there. Uh, Michael Robertson, this is the guy from DAR.FM. He, he takes exception to the Univision claim, stating that all DAR.FM recordings are stored in password-protected storage and automatic downloading for listening later doesn't lead to copyright infringement. Uh, and I, That's right. I, I, I don't guess that they're, you know, parsing out the songs and somehow getting rid of, you know, intros that may be over it or commercials that are, that, that, that are part of the programming. Uh, you always, if you're, a, if you're a live listener, you always have the option of punching to another channel. If the commercial comes on, you don't want to hear it or turning the radio off. You've got the same options. If you're, if you're downloading time shifted material, if, if maybe there's a, a popular uh, Hispanic morning show on a station, but you can't listen in the morning, but you want to listen to it while you're at work a few hours later. Isn't that what uh, DAR.FM service is, is about letting you do something like that? Yeah, absolutely. I actually, when I first heard of it uh, some time ago uh, and the places where I was working and doing some uh, content testing of things, I purposely signed up, uh, registered, password protected my recordings and did a whole series of, of um, you know, time shifting, if you will, time warping for others, um, of programs. They were in, in, in their entirety. There was no stripping of commercials. Everything was exactly as it should be. Um, and I actually, years ago, had a product from Pogo Electronics, which was an AM-FM uh, solid-state recording uh, device that was designed for time-shifting, if you will, program material. So what they had to do because of pressure from the, you know, the geniuses at the uh, MPAA, RIA, and everybody else, when, they made it, when it made a recording off of the FM tuner or AM tuner, the quality of the recording was subpar. I mean, if you think G.722 on an ISDN or IP <laughs> connection has issues, this... Was I mean the Kelp algorithm from France Telecom has a better chance of, of entertaining your your, uh, your ears than what they did to this just to protect the content or the the copyright. I, I talked to the guys at, at Pogo. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. They they, they said no. We, we had no choice. They came after us. I was like, this is this is ridiculous. Huh. But huh. You know, Jack Valenti, I, rest in peace. But I get it. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it seems to me, hey, anybody that wants to basically extend the reach of my transmitter or let my listeners listen to things they like at more convenient times, uh, it seems I'd be in all in favor of that. Um, of course, if, if, and there's all, if, if, if you're worried about people tuning out the commercials or doing something else, they, they, do that, they do that even during the Super Bowl. People leave the TV. Not as much, but even during the Super Bowl, they leave the TV and go get you know, a beer or go to the bathroom, and, and, and they may not see or hear the the the, uh, the commercials um, makes me wonder though about product placement during songs. Wouldn't that be interesting? Hmm. 
Hey, one more thing I want to bring to everyone's attention uh, before we get into our main subject on this episode. Uh, la the last show we did two weeks ago, uh, uh, Chuck Lakatus was telling us about his uh, transmitters, um, uh, his AM transmitters from both the Harris and, and, and Nautel that uh, were being updated to do this uh, this energy saving thing where the, the carrier level was not fixed at you know 10 kilowatts. It could vary uh, based upon uh, the algorithm's uh, uh, desire to place the carrier at a different level to save power. Um, then there's a couple different you know, uh, algorithms for doing that. Uh, some different thinking, different approaches. But in either case, you can you can save 20 to 33 uh, percent AC power. And in, in Alaska, where it's really expensive, that could mean something. Well, it turns out that uh, according to uh, RadioWorld.com, uh, Nautel is doing a webinar that will explore uh, these power saving techniques. You can go into maybe a bit more depth than, uh, than we did. Uh, the uh, webinar is going on Wednesday, October 19th at, uh, at noon Eastern time. You can go to the RadioWorld.com website and look that up, Nautel uh, webinar for AM power saving techniques. I'm sure they'll let you sign up for that and get some information. I, I really enjoyed hearing that from, from Chuck. And my goodness, paying essentially 48 cents per kilowatt hour for electricity. Holy cow. That's... Uh, that's got to be about five or six times more than we pay here in Nashville, Tennessee, for example. Uh, is, is, is that pretty outrageous? 40 cents a kilowatt hour? That's extremely outrageous. Than we pay in New York State. <laughs> yeah, well, in, in, in New York City, or not New York City, but where our transmitter is in Jersey, I mean, in, in the summer, we're paying, you know, 12 to 14 cents a kilowatt hour. So, yeah, that is outrageous. It's unbelievable. Now, now, Chris Tarr, up there in, in, in Wisconsin, you, you guys have uh, generators that run on beer, don't you? That's pretty cheap. <laughs> beer and brats. You know, the kind of gas we have here in Wisconsin, I can't really get into. <laughs> beer and brats. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So what does what power cost up there in your area, Chris? It's really not bad. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't off the top of my head give you an exact number, but uh, power, power costs here in the Midwest are generally pretty reasonable. Um, Wisconsin, especially compared to surrounding states, are uh, much better, you know, much, much less expensive. Um, but we also are very big, uh, I'm finding nowadays, very big into uh, alternative uh, power generation. So, for example, Wisconsin has many, many, many wind farms. And uh, we can also buy, you know, alternative credit for uh, power from those wind farms and, and generate it in other ways. So, you know, we're, we're kind of a uh, little bit ahead of the curve when it comes to those alter, uh, alternative generation methods. The last story I want to, uh, oh, thanks, Chris, I didn't. Didn't thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the last story I want to bring to your attention is, uh, well, the, the AES convention is going on in uh, New York City uh, next week. The uh, conference starts October 20th, and the exhibits start the next day day. Uh, yours truly is going to be on a, about three panels. Uh, lots of lots of uh, folks who uh, you've heard of and, and know, some folks that have been on the show are going to be uh, up on panels. Scott Feibush, who's been a guest on our show, is going to be on some panels. Uh, like I said, I, I will be. Uh, Frank Foti is going to be on some audio processing panels. Uh, who else here? Oh, I'm sure Greg Oganowski and, uh, oh yeah, and Greg is, and Bob Orban will be on a, a panel. Uh, Skip Peasy, who's been on this show several times, plus Bill Sachs. Bill and his wife Kim were on the show. Talking about all Audio processing and and uh, and a lot about uh, streaming audio too, uh, and processing for for streaming. It's going to be a, a really exciting uh, convention. Here's how you find out more about it: go to aesbroadcast.com, aesbroadcast.com. And the news story that has to do with this, I didn't I didn't know this. Uh, you New York guys probably did. Uh, in in RadioWorld.com, there's an article called "Tech Tours Are a Gem of AES." And there are tours of various New York audio facilities that uh, will be that will be going on during uh, the AES convention. So you can go to New York and get tours of these incredible places, like the Demena Center for Classical Music, or Brooklyn Phono, or Sear Sound, or uh, NBC Broadcast Central at Thirty Rock. That's a cool place. I've been through a, a little bit of that myself. Um, Chris, Tom, have you guys gotten to take any of these tours of audio facilities? Maybe not not broadcast facilities necessarily, but other recording type facilities. Well, not the oh, yeah, recording absolutely. facilities, I've but I was up at um, NBC uh, Central. Uh, actually, I was in the bowels of NBC Central last week, and uh, let me tell you, <laughs> you sit there and look around and go, "Oh my God, it's unbelievable." Chris Tobin. Yeah, I've uh, I've done the TV ones. I've done uh, post recording studios. Uh, a few of the uh, recording halls or the, the music halls, they're great. Yeah, when the AES does it in Simpty, 
the, the TV folks, uh, those are great uh, tours to take. And we've been doing them with the SBE as well. Um, I, I'm, I'm just I'm amazed by the, the, these, these good-looking facilities. In, in the article, uh, Tech Tours are a gem of AES. Uh, there's a great picture of uh, the uh, Demena Center. Uh, they're Mary Flagler Carey Hall. Okay, a lot to say. Named after someone, obviously. It is just a huge, beautiful uh, room and uh, just, a, I'm sure, a great audio environment. If you're interested in audio, and I'm, I'm kind, you know, even though I'm in broadcast, and hey, we guys in broadcast, we, we tend to be a lot less concerned about the the uh, the acoustics of a room because we're not doing you know recording type stuff. Sure, we, we have studios to deal with and we usually try to deaden those. Uh, it's usually not up uh, up to us to try to liven the studio or control the sound precisely. Uh, oftentimes, good enough is good enough, especially when you're using you know close talking microphones that that reject a lot of other sound. But these recording studios where they have to use just a variety of mics, always the right kind of mic for the for the right instrument, for the right voice, for the and and uh, and and then the, they just the ambient uh, um, uh, situation that you can get f from the room and how the room is designed. It's just amazing to me that people spend their whole lives uh, thinking and working on, on this kind of stuff. Um, uh, I, it, it, any of you guys have a, a story to tell or an experience in a, in a recording studio that you'd want to, you want to relate to us, especially about the you know, design and sound? I, I, I recently uh, just walked through uh, WNYC here in New York City, which is part of the New York Public Radio group and uh, Jim Stagnito is the director of engineering. He uh, offered me a, a look-see and they have a street level uh, a studio for performances um, which is a floating studio. So a floating studio is literally if you can picture a box within a box and between the two boxes are springs that isolate the, uh, the, the surfaces and uh, the, the studio, their studio facility, the radio stations uh, there are classical stations and, and uh, other stuff, uh, sit above uh, the subway, uh, the New York City subway system. So you can imagine what it sounds like on the street when the subway goes through, and then this building is sitting right on top, and then you're in this performance studio. Literally, all you hear is a low rumble, I mean, really low rumble of the, the subway beneath. Outside, you don't even hear the sirens as the police or fire engines go by or emergency vehicles. It is unbelievable. And he's told me, as a musician, he's performed and practiced in the facility, and no no need of uh, front of house speakers or you know monitors on the on the stage. Everything is is balanced perfectly. And then they have several studios for the radio programs where they do performances as well. Uh, I think they do a performance for XM, so they do it right out of this small performance studio. You walk in, and your body, your mind, your your, your sense of motion sort of is diminished because the room is so isolated from the building and from everything yeah. else. It's it's just wild. So if you're ever in New York City and have an opportunity, you know, give those guys a call. If they have time, they'll show you around. It's really worth checking out. You walk into a room from, say, a, a hallway. It has a certain ambient sound, you know, and then you walk in, the door closes, you feel the air pressure change, and it's just silence. You in the room. It's really, it's, it takes you back for a moment. It's pretty cool. I I've been in a room like that that was just absolutely silent, and after a moment, your ears become adjusted, and you hear not only your heartbeat, but then you might even hear the blood coursing through the, the veins and arteries in your neck and, and near your ears. It is, it is weird. Yeah, I was going to say, oh, yeah. when, I, when I went to college, the music school had a, had a room like that. They called it a dead room, and you walked in, and it, it was eerie after a little while. You'd stand there and go, <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> The dead room. <laughs> That's a good description. Well, uh, uh, I can't think of a segue oh. from the dead room. <laughs> I'm sorry, go, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, you got something else? Uh, by the way, uh, for the AES, you know, you and I are on a panel for backhaul in the 21st century. We are. Oh, my gosh. I better do some research on this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So you had, no clue, you had no clue what you're going to be doing? Is this just like a big surprise to you? Or? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, been a, I've been a little busy lately. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, well, uh, tell you what, uh, Chris, you and I need to, Chris Tobin, you and I need to compare notes, uh, uh maybe in the next day or two <laughs> about that, Certainly. about that panel, that the, the backhaul panel is, I mean, certainly you know, we know what backhaul is, but I'm, I'm, I'm working on thinking of, uh, uh, you know, something e either, you know, I'm not sure what is obvious to me because I'm I'm in the you know in the business of, of this that may not be obvious to other folks. So I'm just I guess I'm just looking for an angle on uh, 
on how to talk, or what to talk about backhaul. I guess, I guess, you know, IP audio, that's, that's where backhaul is. Hey, I was just talking to uh, Matt Aaron, who uh, works for, you know, for the Dave Ramsey show. And uh, they're still using some ISDN for their big uh, uh, Entra leadership tour, but they've got IP audio for backup. And in some locations where they won't, won't have ISDN, the IP audio will be the main. And, you know, eventually, someday, IP audio will be the main thing if it's not already for, for plenty of stations. Um, so there, there's your backhaul right, right there. Um, <laughs> yes, Wenco, MPLS. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. We need to, we, we need to have, uh, uh, Wenco in the chat room on the show to talk about MPLS. I, I keep telling him that I, we'll have you on really. We'll have you on. Okay. Let's take a quick uh, break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about why, when, when you've waited too late to hire an engineer, we're going to give, uh, uh, you know, some, some, some stories and, and how folks, how to know maybe when, yeah. Probably ought to hire an engineer and maybe some bad things that have happened by not getting an engineer involved soon enough or the wrong engineer. That's coming right up. Right now, I want to tell you about uh, the sponsor of our show, Telos, Omnia, and Axia. And that's my employer. But um, I'm not going to describe any particular piece of gear. Uh, there's a publication that we have uh, that we, Telos, has out. And, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I don't have one right here handy. I did. For last week's show, that it, it's up, we'll probably bring it up on the screen. How about that? Burke, uh, when, when you can. Uh, that there you go. The now catalog from Telos Omni and Axia. This is a thing of beauty. It's a like it's a coffee table book. It is absolutely gorgeous. It's not hardcover. Kind of thinking about that. But it it is just it is how many pages is that thing? It's almost a hundred pages. Uh, there are articles. There are white papers in there. Uh, there are diagrams, how things hook up, how stuff in the new world of IP audio, IP phones, IP consoles, how all this stuff. Oh, there's Leo. There's Leo in his uh, uh, his uh, Axia console back at the Twit Cottage. Now he uh, now Leo has a uh, uh, a different console uh, from us. He's got the the Radius console uh, in uh, in his own personal studio. So this catalog is absolutely gorgeous, chock full of information, history of telephony. That's pretty interesting. Uh, a little. Uh, um, uh, tribute to Alexander Graham Bell from uh, our lead R&D engineer, Greg Shea. I mean, Greg is a, this guy is a, you know, scientist level engineer. He is just awesome with, uh, with the fine points of, of telephony. This, and that's why Telos Hybrid sounds so good. So the catalog, will, uh, Frank Foti's in there. There's a word from Denny Sanders. Denny is a, a well-known um, uh, uh, programming expert and um, uh, Denny goes through some some uh, some tips for processing uh, to to really print well on the air, uh, and that's in the catalog too. Of course, then there's you know pictures of all the Telos and Omni and Axia products as well. Here's one of the really cool things about the uh, the Telos catalog. You know, if if I was a good host, I would have this already done and figured out. I'm gonna take my iPad here and open her up to uh, to iBooks. And I'm going to go to my, my little library here. There, there's my, here. This is my library of downloaded uh, PDFs. And right there's the now, the now catalog. This is so, so pretty uh, in the, uh, in the, in, in the, uh, on, on the iPad. So there's a whole bunch of pictures of folks with Axia Studios. Uh, there's Leo again from that spread. And you can really read this catalog really nicely right there in your iPad. It is just so cool and pretty. And if you want to get a close-up, well, you know, you can just do the, do the thing where you squeeze or pinch or whatever and, uh, and, and get some close-up pictures. Absolutely gorgeous. All the, the, the call-outs are all here to point out what the different knobs and buttons do on, on the various products. Check it out. All you have to do is go to any one of our websites, and there will be a link there to, um, uh, to get you to register for the catalog. We have sent about 20,000 of these catalogs out around the world. If you haven't gotten yours or if you just want another one, uh, go to the website, any of the websites like telos-systems.com or omniaaudio.com or axiaaudio.com or even our new consolidated website, telosalliance.com and click on the button to get yourself a catalog. We'll mail it out to you within uh, a week, 10 days or so, it's as soon as we can... Uh, Gather enough of them up to haul them all down to the post office. Yes, the post office. And at the same time, you can download your own copy and have it on your computer, your iPad, whatever is convenient for you. Thanks a lot to Telos Systems, Omnia Audio, and Axia Audio for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. And I do encourage you to get your catalog. You're going to like it. Circle a few things. Put some post-it notes in there. Maybe you're... Leave it on your boss's desk. There you go. That'll do it. All right. Let's jump into our uh, subject matter for uh, uh, the rest of the show. Why... You should hire an engineer. When did you really wait too long to hire an engineer? And uh, Chris Tarr, 
I think you have a, an anecdotal story for us and some wisdom and learning is the, the right time to make sure you have an engineer involved. Sure. Well, I, you know, I got a phone call uh, a few weeks ago for this uh, this radio station, uh, I'll remain nameless, but an AM radio station, saying, you know, oh, we're having all kinds of problems. Uh, you know, we're hearing a couple of different stories about what's going on, but uh, you know, the bottom line is, is that the station just doesn't get out as you know as far as it should, and audio doesn't sound good. Could you come down and take a look? So sure enough, you know, no problem. Went down there, took a look. And I mean, this transmitter was running at about a tenth, uh, one quarter power. The audio is really weak. The transmitter was was having issues, and it was pretty obvious that uh, you know nobody had paid any attention to this site for at least a couple of years. And uh, you know, it looks like uh, you know I've run into this before, where um, you know the owners look at it as a gamble. It's like, okay, well, you know, things are running, so I don't need to have somebody come and take a look at things. Everything's okay because we're on the air. Everything's okay. And you know, the the long story short is, is I had to spend several hours, many, you know, well over 20, 30 hours, making repairs. And uh, you know, what happens is they probably spent as much just on that as they would have if they would have paid somebody to come once every month or once every couple of months to clean up and, you know, check on things, make sure everything was working. And, uh, you know, it's kind of an insurance policy. And, and what happens is I find, I, cause I had more, more than one client like this where I won't, I'll won't hear from them for like a year. And then all of a sudden get the emergency call that things have fallen apart and I need you to come down. And, uh, you know, kind of the lesson that I, I try, I try to teach some of these guys, not everybody, but, Guys like that, I kind of teach a lesson because I tack on an emergency fee when you do that. You know, I always explain it's much cheaper to have me come on my time and take a look and make sure things are okay and clean out filters and things than it does to have me come down on the transmitter's time. So, uh, you know, it's always more cost effective. It, it seems counterintuitive, but it's a lot like insurance. You know, if you, you pay me to come down every couple of months and clean, you know, clean out your transmitter, make sure everything's okay, all the fans are lubricated and uh, you know, that sort of thing, I can save you a lot of hassle because who knows how long that transitor is running that way. Uh, you know, they just said, oh, for a while it's been like that. And who knows how much revenue they've lost and, and potential listeners that they've lost, you know, things like that just because general maintenance wasn't done. So, you know, that's kind of my, my uh, you know, the, what, the soapbox that I'm on tonight is, uh, you know, at least if, you're, if you have a station or you're involved with a station that maybe doesn't have a full-time engineer, Get a contract engineer, but, you know, don't wait until something's broken to have him come out and fix it. You know, get yourself on a maintenance plan, work out a deal. For example, uh, you know, for this particular station, uh, they've put me on a retainer so that, uh, you know, uh, as part of the fee, every three months I'll come down and clean everything out, make sure it works, and, and uh, you know, I'll take care of, of any issues that, that come up. Uh, but, uh, you know, at least then they've got some insurance policy that something's being done and that it's not just waiting until everything uh, just falls apart to have me come down. And, you know, it'll cost you as much or more to do that with, you know, plus then you have the off air time and all these other things. You know, I, I was just making you thinking about an analogy. Uh, you, you wouldn't, well, some people would, you, you normally, you wouldn't drive your car and not change the oil and not do any maintenance to it at all until the engine just locked up and then replace the engine. Or then, you know, get the best price you can on doing a top-end overhaul or, you know, changing out the piston rings. And yet that's exactly what some station owners or managers, uh, and sadly, some, in, some lazy engineers, uh, do with, with their gear. They, they don't take care of it uh, until it actually fails. And when it fails, when they're off the air or the power is so low it doesn't get out or it sounds so distorted uh, or there's, there's something else wrong that's just so bad they can't stand it anymore, then they call an engineer. Um, and, and, and here's a situation where in this case with this particular transmitter model, what caused the, the power to, to drop on the transmitter is that it burned up some, uh, some transistors, some power transistors. Why did they burn up? Because the, the mouse had gotten into the fan, chewed it up, and the fan seized up. Transmitter was running hot for, for how, who knows how long. And, you know, the heat just finally fatigued the, the FETs and the transmitter. So had I, uh, you know, had, had somebody been on this right away, we would have noticed, oh, the fan's messed up. We need to fix that and probably would have saved them several hundred dollars in, in transistors. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've seen fans. You know, a lot of transmitters, the fan now is the only mechanical 
uh, thing left in there. I mean, the, the only thing that spins and or uh, you know is is going to its bearings are going to wear out or or need lubrication. And that fan's there for a reason. If that fan dies, transfer gets quiet and may not run a whole lot longer. Hey, Tom and Chris Tobin. Okay, in, in New York City, you don't have these kind of problems. Do you? All the stations get fully taken care of. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> At least ours do. <laughs> well, now they. they there are some stations that unfortunately have fallen victim of that um, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, I have received many a call from folks on a contract basis. And uh, when you look at what's left of the place after they forgot to take, was he change the filters on the fans that draw the air through the transmitter? Oh, that's right. There's the door filter that helps the room stay certain. Yeah, yeah, there's been a few. Uh, but there, I, I can assure you that the, the, the ones that I worked with, the CBS ones, definitely have regular routine maintenance and uh, they see the value of making sure everything is 100%. As Tom pointed out, you know, he has the same same situation. But there are some uh, that just it's out of sight, out of mind. They're, if they hear things are on the air, why do I have to bother? Why do I need to do that? And unfortunately, it, as Chris pointed out, it comes a day when it happens and the cost is, you know, pay me now, pay me later. And if they pay me later, it tends to be very high. But, you know, rightly so. Or you get the stations that uh, hire the guy who, from the VCR repair shop or VCR TV repair shop well, up the street, uh, and they're <laughs> dealing with a uh, with an AM directional antenna, and all of a sudden the commission walks in and informs them that their monitor points are out of tolerance, and now what? Because the guy doesn't work with RF, and you know, you know, you know yeah, I have, I have that story. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, well, I was going to say the station that I, I had to go work on. It's funny, Tom, because that's exactly what it was. It was a guy who did uh, wired phone systems. And so, you know, they had him wiring up equipment in the studio. And after a while, he just kind of became the engineer. And it's a directional AM and it was all messed up. And it was because, you know, this guy didn't know what he was doing with that. So that's exactly what happened. That's kind of funny. <laughs> Oh, and the scary thing is uh, p people who don't know or don't really understand directionals, the, one of the first things they want to do is they want to <laughs> walk in and they want to grab you. They, they want to just grab a, a knob on the phaser and start cranking. You sit there and go, oh, no, don't tell well, me. Well, you know, I, I'll, I'll, dig a <laughs> little deeper. I'll, I'll dig a little deeper into this story just because since we're, we're talking about that, uh, one of the, the things that they, they also mentioned was that this guy had said that one of their towers was shorted out. I went, okay, I, I'm pretty sure that's not the case because you'd have a lot of other problems besides that. So, you know, went and did a monitor point, and sure enough, it was fine. Uh, it turns out that uh, this somebody, and I don't know who, uh, somebody involved with that had flipped the, uh, it's a two-tower directional, uh, had flipped the two sample lines in the antenna monitor around. And uh, so obviously the, the intended monitor wasn't functioning correctly, and that led them to believe that there was something, you know, some serious failure. But again, somebody didn't know what they were doing and was probably just playing around with the wires and, and you know, mixed them up. What does this mm. do? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, you know, uh, before the, the show uh, and last week when we, we didn't have the show, uh, I remember now what it was that... Uh, that I was called upon to, uh, to to fix. I've mentioned on this show that I'm part owner of some radio stations. I, I own the part that doesn't make any money, unfortunately. But I we, we have a couple stations in American Samoa, and we have um, uh, some stations that we're buying, some we own, some that we're buying and, and LMAing in, uh, in Mississippi. And on one of those stations, oh, we had a license for a translator. We had to get the translator on the air, and uh, I couldn't get down there soon enough. This was back a, a week and a half ago. And so my business partner, Larry, uh, and, and Larry does an amazing amount of engineering, and some of it he does right, and some of it is just a little over his head, and he does the best he can. Um, uh, and he, yeah, he could have hired an engineer closer to the area to come over and, and do this, but you know, he, okay, Kirk's going to be down. We'll, we'll fix it. Well, well, here's what he did. And this is, this is just so typical for someone who doesn't know the right ins and outs of getting this done. Again, did the best he could, but here's what he did. So we have this AM transmitter site uh, that was a three tower. It's being converted to a single tower and with a lot less power at night, uh, just to simplify things so there'll be no, no more phaser involved. And on the tower, on the, the sole remaining AM tower, we put the translator antenna, a little tube A 
pretty cheap, you know, bent metal an antenna. And uh, cool. let's see, there was a seven eighths inch coax coming down. There's a um, an isocoupler at the bottom. You guys know what an isocoupler is, right? Uh, it's kind of hard to find anymore. You can still buy the really good ones from Kentronics. And this one was um, mm, a less good one, um, uh, <laughs> made out of some PVC pipe. And I don't know what's inside. Probably a couple of you know loops looking at each other. And so this isocoupler, the idea there is to you know keep the AM tower hot. And, uh, and let us still bring a coax up onto the AM tower uh, without shorting the, the, the tower out and without converting it to a folded unipole, which we might someday. Anyway, uh, the, the, the tower, the, Larry didn't know mm. to tell the tower guy any different. The coax comes down the tower and it's bonded at a few places, uh, you know, to, to keep it in, at that, you know, to keep circulating currents from happening. And uh, so again, it's an AM tower with an FM two bay antenna mounted on the side of it near the top. And so the coax comes down and it goes into the top of this uh, isocoupler. Well, then the then the 7 eighths coax comes out the bottom of the isocoupler. And rather than, than bring that into the building in a nice manner, uh, the tower guy looped it back up the tower about 20 feet, tied it off in a few places, and then brought it in the building. Well, this made a nice capacitor between the uh, oh of course oh, and larry said hey when i bring the coax into the building well first of all it's kind of hot and uh it's got some rf on it and second of all when i plug in when i plug it in the back of the fm transmitter um the uh when i do that the uh the am transmitter goes off the air that's <laughs> well yeah that's what would happen larry it's exactly what would happen uh the am transmitter goes off the air because they'll load the impedance into which it looks has changed uh, outside of the bounds that it wants to feed into. And so the automatic, uh, uh, you know, standing wave ratio protection circuit, the Viswer protection circuit uh, kicks in and the transmitter goes off. So, uh, so Larry said, yeah, so uh, obviously we can't have this. We've got to keep the AM transmitter on. And how can we do this? Well, so Larry described what the guy did. Well, you know, cut that coax. He just used some cable ties. Cut that extra coax off the tower, bring it in, sweep it nicely, make a drip loop if you want to, bring it in the building, and then put it in the transmitter. He did that. Works fine. No problem there. We still need to retweak the uh, antenna tuning unit so it's perfect and spot on. But uh, actually, the reflected power is very, very low. So it's, it's pretty good. Anyway, and we do have to remeasure it for impedance with the, the new antenna on it. Well, now the next problem was this. Uh, this translator and the AM transmitter are, are simulcasting. Okay, so same audio on both services at the moment. The AM transmitter and the FM translator uh, have the same, same audio. Um, so uh, Larry had uh, taken the FM transmitter and the exciter, the just small solid state ones, and just didn't have, didn't want to put them in the rack. It was just too much and kind of heavy. So he took a five gallon bucket, turned it upside down, put it in the middle of the room, put the, the transmitter on the five gallon bucket, ran a cord over to the, to the AC plug in the wall, plugged it in, ran the power the uh, the RF uh, you know to the antenna, the antenna lead, ran that to the transmitter, and then ran a little piece of uh, RG58 coax with BNC connectors on it from the STL receiver over to the input on the exciter. Okay, you got the picture? Um, I didn't mention a ground anywhere there. That's kind of key here. There's no ground was mentioned. And so Does Larry, Larry turned Mr. Goldberg by any chance? <laughs> 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 so so Here's a transmitter on a five-gallon bucket, power cord, RF coax, and uh, and the uh, and, and the, the 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 baseband, you know, the the multiplex signal coming from the uh, the STL, the 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 the, the uh, uh, um, audio processor and the stereo generator, you know, are back at, at the studio, and we're sending composite out to the transmitter side. Well, Larry turned it on, and said, "Well, you know, I I hear the the station. I remember he's simulcasting. I I hear the station on the translator, but it's really distorted and doesn't sound very good." So okay, well uh, maybe it's just okay. Well, we'll we'll play with the modulation. So uh, looking at it, and realizing this is a bad situation. Okay, let me see if it's just uh, we're hitting too too much signal on the multiplex input. So I took my little greenie and went to the back of the uh, Italian-made STL receiver and I started turning it, turning the composite output level down. Um, I had already tried on the front of the exciter and didn't seem to be getting anywhere. So I went to the back of the uh, STL, turned it down, 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 still 120% modulation on the exciter. Turn it down, 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 still 120% modulation on the exciter. Turn it down, turn it down, turn it down some more. Uh, this, uh, how many, is this a 100 turn pot? Well, <laughs> the modulation didn't go anywhere. And then I had a thought, hmm. Let's turn the AM transmitter off and just see what happens. So we turn the AM transmitter off, modulation dies on the uh, translator. Okay, well, all that signal that the translator was modulating wasn't coming from the STL. 
it was coming in RF wise and being demodulated in the front in the audio front end of the exciter, and then it was using that to run run the modulator in the exciter. So I go back and, and turn the uh, output of the STL receiver back up. Turn it up. Turn it up. Turn it up. Ah, there's 100% modulation. Good. Now we got to make it not happen when we turn the AM transmitter back on. And well, the only way to do that for sure is we're going to rack mount this gear, make sure it's well grounded, uh, have the cable that goes from the STL into the exciter to be a whole lot shorter, and uh, see how that works. So we did all that. Uh, by the way, we turned the AM transmitter on just to make sure. Then yeah, sure enough, that was the problem. AM just getting all over the in the input to the uh, to the exciter. So. Um, with Larry's help, we took these heavy, you know, amplifiers and stuff and, and put them in the rack, uh, shortened up all the cables, did it right, turned it on, it all worked perfectly, perfectly. And the only, you know, the only difference really was, was it sitting in the middle of the floor or was it in the rack? And we all know about the grounding situation that naturally occurred because it was, it was in the rack well. Yeah, I could have run extra strap to the devices. It appeared I didn't need to because it's well grounded th through the rack. And it was, it was a whole lot better than it was. And it was you know, good enough for me until we get around to running the, the you know, separate copper strap. But so that's my story. Larry, hi <laughs> hire an engineer. Good try, but no, no, hire an engineer. No, 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 but now you know something, Kirk. Yeah? If that STL dies, you have an alternate. That's, That's right. right. <laughs> <laughs> we do. We have an alternate audio feed. Uh, actually, the STL also feeds the AM. Well, bummer, dude. Oops. Yeah. The, 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 the STL is, is uh, it's, it's uh, well, we, we, we got to put an AM processor out there. But so at the moment, it's an FM. It's, it's, hey, it's small town. Okay. It's, we're on, on cheap. So that's, uh, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, Tom, I, I know that you have an example of some time that somebody should have hired an engineer. What can you tell us about that? Oh, Lord. <laughs> um, a uh, colleague and I were hired at one point to, uh, to move an FM transmitter, which we did in a day. Um, and we had, to, uh, the first, we, we had to go down and... Um, since the since the antenna was mounted on a hot AM stick, we had to uh, while we were waiting for the moving company to bring the transmitter over after we disconnected it, we had to uh, retweak the uh, operating impedance on the AM tower because you know when you put something on an AM tower, the impedance will shift a little bit. Uh, and actually, this is quite <laughs> this is actually a funny story. But um, so we get to the transmitter building, we're standing around, standing around, standing around, nobody there. Finally, uh, you know. Looked on the looked on a on the on the wall in the room we were supposed to put the transmitter in. There's a phone number, so we called it. Happened to be the control room at the AM station. And the guy goes, "Oh yeah, the key's hidden under this rock over here, and just go ahead and get it, and go ahead and shut the transmitter off." So, oh God! So we get we look under the rock, get the key, walk in the room, dig through the trash, <laughs> get over to the transmitter, shut it off, and uh, proceed to walk out to the tower. Dig through the weeds, open the box, get the mice nest out, or the mouse nest out, and now we we take a look at the impedance, and it was like, you know, 47 ohms instead of 50. It's okay. Well, we'll we'll bring it up to 50, and because the FCC rules say you have to, and and we're gonna have to file this anyway. We'll we'll do the sweep, and I'm standing there, and I I've my my, my buddy's name is Chuck, and I hand him the uh, hand him the notebook, and I said, look, I'll do the measurements, you just write it down. Okay. Well, here's the frequency, Tom. Yeah, just write this down. Tom, would you write this down? Tom, what? Turn around. I look like this. There is a black snake behind me that's this big around and at least 15 <laughs> feet long, and we took out of there like a shot. <clears throat> it, took, it took us 20 minutes before we'd ever even dare go back in there. We got it done in a real hurry, put it back together. It actually worked. Turned the AM back on, called the jock, and he, he, he was like, yeah, okay, fine. I'm back on the air. Uh, who cares? Oh, God. <laughs> but, but I tell you, having to dig through the trash, having to pull the mouse nest out of the uh, tuning network, it was like, anybody ever come here? Good Lord. <laughs> Jeez. Jeez. Uh, okay, Mr. Tobin, what have you got for us? Anytime that, anything we can learn from? They should have hired an engineer oh. before they finally got me out here. They should have hired an engineer, yes. Well, I had an experience many years ago where a radio station had let their engineer go for whatever reason and decided that their IT person was uh, well suited for the job. Uh, so, you know, the, the person decided to take it and figured, oh, this would be great. You know, I do this, that, and the other thing, whatever. And a couple of months go by and I'm at my office at the radio station I'm working at across town in the same market. I get a phone call from a gentleman who says, I need your help. It's important. 
can you uh, meet me at the radio station tomorrow morning? I was like, well, I, yeah, okay, but you know it's my competitor. It's not like really I, I don't work for them. He goes, yeah, I know that, but I need somebody else here that can witness what I have to do. I was like, really? All right, fair enough. Well, well come on out because I know the guy. I said, I'll come out and uh, be more than happy to meet you out front and then take me upstairs and we'll do whatever it is you need to do. So I arrived at the radio station the following morning. Mind you, he contacted the station engineer, the designated engineer, the IT person the day before the, when he spoke to me, told him, you need to come out here. I'm coming out and you need to be here. We've got some issues with your, your signal. I arrive the next morning with this gentleman. We go up to the lobby of the station, looking around, waiting for the engineer to show up. No show. General manager, manager of the radio station is uh, livid and can't figure out why they can't find the guy. So this person says to me, we need to go out to the transmitter. You have to come with me. By now, if you haven't guessed, this person I'm escorting is a member of the FCC's New York office. And um, I go out to the transmitter site, and sure enough, the station is it's an AM station. It's a directional AM, high-powered, over-modulating. So you can imagine the negative uh, signal, the negative side of the waveform was uh, quite negative, <laughs> more than you'd like. And the positive side was, well... You know, the bell R meter can only go so high, and it's, the needle just stays topped. <laughs> so <laughs> any, anyone in the, in the audience that has worked on an AM signal and has accidentally modulated that carrier way beyond its limits, you know what happens when, when you do that. So um, I'm out there. I, uh, the general manager of the radio station on the phone says, yes, do what you have to do because, uh, you know, I understand where you work and what you do, and thank you very much. I get them back to where they need to be just to stay somewhat legal. Engineer shows up two hours later than he should have explains to this FCC inspector what he was trying to do the night before. The FCC inspector looks at him and says, did you not have a phone conversation with another engineer in the market explaining to you what not to do when you were out here doing some stuff? Yeah. And you still proceeded to do it anyway? Well, yeah, because I needed to. Okay, fine. Basically, he was on the phone with, uh, with me the night before telling me that he had the FCC coming out to in, uh, check his station and that they had some issues. And I told him, don't do anything. Leave it alone. They've already checked your signal. You're dead meat if it's in trouble. If it's not, then you're fine. Just leave it alone. He didn't. Because he's an IT guy who thinks, like, well, I could do this and that because he told me. He goes, well, I, you know, I do this with computer stuff. I said, it's not the same. This is not a big computer that has an antenna stuck to it. It's very different. And, uh, well, needless to say, that person lost his job uh, two days later. Station was fined several thousand dollars and then some. While we're at the transmitter site, we look over at the FM transmitter. Nice facility. You know, it's well-maintained, at least it appeared that way. And there was a broom handle. If you can think of a broom handle leaning at about a 45-degree angle from the floor to the front <laughs> of the transmitter. Oh, no. And the FCC inspector looks at me, I look at him, and he's like, it really isn't doing what we think it is. I was like, I think it is. <laughs> think of the end of the stick holding the, 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 uh, the circuit breaker for the plate of the transmitter, plate volts, in the on position. Oh, that's even worse than I thought. I thought maybe it's just holding the on button on, or maybe holding the door closed. But no, it's holding the no, brake. No, 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 no. Oh. This was classic. I was, I was like, oh. wow, check it out. So get back on the phone with the general manager. Explain to the general manager the situation. I need to remove the stick from the transmitter. <laughs> and they're like, what? There's a stick in the transmitter? Well, it's not exactly in it, but it seems to be propped up against it. And I'm afraid what will happen is when I remove it, you might go off the air momentarily. Oh. Well, we did it. Sure enough, that break a trip real fast. <laughs> <laughs> so um, managed to get them on their backup transmitter for that day. And that evening, I wound up going out there and doing some contract work, the pay me later routine. And boy, let me tell you, IT folks, RF is a very serious thing. It's, it's meant to be treated a certain way. If you're ever put in a situation where you need to work on a transmitter, decline or find someone who knows how to work on it and work with them. Do not. <laughs> Do this by yourself. Please. This is twice I've been out to the transmitter site where an IT guy was trying to be good. I get it. Yeah, but just yeah. way, way out of their league. Yeah. They propped up. If you could visualize a large transmitter box, front panel with many buttons and circuit breakers. You know, it was a nice size circuit breaker with a broom handle literally propped up against it. It was just, it was a great sight. Well, it was like, at, oh. least it, at least the breaker wasn't bypassed. <laughs> no, no, yeah. the, the interlocks of the transmitter were. And no, 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 I mean, jumpered across the breaker inside the yeah, transmitter. Yeah, but behind the breaker. Oh, even that. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah true, true, good point. Oh, oh yeah, gee. that was a doozy. Hey, here, okay, quick final question. How, how can 
uh, how can a station owner, and I'm thinking maybe a small town station owner, uh, you know, an owner operator, mom and pop kind of radio station, how can an owner operator know if he's being given decent advice by who, whatever kind of engineer is giving him advice? And what comes to mind is a station that I, I used to do some work for in Southwest Tennessee, real nice couple on the station. And, uh, I got called in, uh, I've been off the air for almost a week now, and uh, I don't know if I believe what the other engineer is telling me. I said, well, what, what's, uh, go to the transmitter site, and the transmitter won't come on. The, the breaker trips immediately on the, on the wall when, uh, when you turn the plates on. And a um, you know, quick look at the bottom of the, of, the, uh, of the transmitter with all the high-voltage parts, you know, the high-voltage supply and the contactor and uh, the, 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 the rectifiers uh, and the, the capacitors and, and the chokes are all down there to make the high-voltage supply. Well... Uh, so I'm, uh, uh, you know, the, obviously something down there is is shorted uh, out probably, and uh, it's up to up to me to find that. So what did the other engineer say? So he, the other engineer said we had to replace everything. I said everything? Yep. So we had to replace everything. It was going to be about ten thousand dollars. Oh, for the plate transformer, new capacitors, new diodes, uh, and new chokes, going to be about ten grand. I said, you know, I can't imagine that everything everything down there failed all at the same time. So, um, you know, I did the divide and conquer thing. You know, I, I you know, schematically, I took the, the power supply apart in half and, uh, you know, narrowed it down to, uh, hey, what's the standard thing that happens to so many power supplies? A choke shorts to its, uh, you know, it's a winding shorts to the frame, right? So the choke is the, the high voltage windings on the choke are now shorted to the frame, which is connected firmly to ground and, uh, you know, takes, takes the thing to ground and blows the circuit breaker. So, uh, Temporarily, you can you can do this. I took a, a block of wood. I made sure I found a, you know a good five thousand volt block of wood, and uh, put it under. <laughs> you know, unbolted the unbolted the, the choke. Put it under the choke. Turn the thing back on. Worked fine. Now we're gonna order a new choke, right? But I said, you know, that's that's what's wrong. That choke, and it's probably about six hundred dollars. Uh, so uh, uh, it might take a few days to get it, or a couple of weeks, depending if they have to wind one. But yeah, we can we can get you one. So uh, th th this it was ten thousand dollars, or it was six hundred bucks, and my service call. So it may have been twelve hundred bucks altogether. How is a, an owner to protect himself from? that kind of advice. And I know it happens in all industries. You take your car and, oh, you need a new transmission. No, you don't need a new transmission. You need a, a change of fluid and we need to replace you know, th this and that. You guys got any advice for that? Chris, I'm going to ask you, Chris uh, Tar, because you're out there where it seems like this can, this can really happen in, the, in, in, in McWanago. Well, I, I don't know how to answer that, actually. <laughs> are you talking about advice for owners in situations like this? Yeah, how, how can an owner protect himself from bad advice from somebody that he's got to trust? You know, I, sometimes you got to get a second opinion. Yeah, you know, if if, if there's if the guy, I told the the person who I was doing this work for now, if if there's any question about anything I'm doing or you don't understand completely anything I'm doing, then ask. And and it's my job to make sure that you understand what we're doing. So, uh, you know, as if I were an owner, that's what I would say is, you know, I, you know, try, trust what the guy's doing, but ask lots of questions. And if you, if you don't feel like you're getting your questions answered to your satisfaction, find somebody else who can answer them for you. Yep. All right. I, I guess you, you know, if you get that feeling like it's maybe not right, obviously that's what this owner did. He didn't trust this word. Re replace everything. Hmm, okay. Sent the guy on his way and, and called me up. Uh, Tom Ray, you got any advice about that? How's, it, how's an owner to know or um, if, if, if the advice is, is right or wrong? Is I would, gut uh, well, well, yeah, no, I, I would agree with Chris. Get a second opinion, but uh, also um, and, and start asking questions and listen to what the answers are. Now, you, you, know, you might not fully understand the answer, but my job as the engineer is to make sure that you understand what I'm talking about because you might not understand the exact way the power supply works. But if I tell you that this thing, this thing has a problem, it's shorted to ground, I put it up on a block of wood to isolate it so it doesn't short anymore, hopefully you, you, know, hopefully you understand that. And if you don't quite understand, ask it and I'll put it in simpler terms. But if you have somebody who starts really talking over your head, um, you know, electronics wise or, or otherwise, that to me is always, almost always a red flag that either the guy doesn't quite know what he's talking about or he just wants to do the job the fast way and get it taken care of and move on. So... I've always thought that a sign of somebody who, who knows what he's talking about and is being honest with you is the ability of that person to put the techno speak into uh, words that you can understand. I think a person who knows what they're doing can explain it in layman's terms 
and, and have it make sense and have you be comfortable with it. Well, you know, right. it, it, and, and I, I get a lot of uh, I get a lot of practice in that. We, we uh, well, the ham radio club I'm with right now, uh, we are doing uh, technician classes for the entry level class, and we have people here who've never been exposed to electronics before. Now, of course, I understand what a transistor does. I'm not going to explain it to them the way I understand it. I'm going to put it in layman's terms so they get it. They don't need a lot of in depth uh, information for the tech license, but they need to know what what it is and what it does. And we're, I'm going to put it. Uh, because I'm teaching Saturday, I'm going to put it in very layman's terms so they get it. Now, if they want to go deeper, I'll always say, come see me after class. But I don't, uh, y you, can't, you can't talk above the person. Y you really can't talk above their skill level. You, you have to bring it down to earth uh, for people. And what you'll find by doing that is the person starts to trust you and starts feeling comfortable with you. Um, and matter of fact, I even encourage, you know, if, if I'll tell somebody, here's what I think, and f please feel free to call somebody else and get a, get a second opinion. Um, and usually if you say something like that, immediately they sit there and go, well, hey, this guy, even if he's not 100% correct, he's got to be at least somewhat honest. He's willing, he, he's told me, go out and get somebody else and, you know, take a look at it and, 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 and double check me. And, you know, that, that goes a long way towards, uh, you know, somebody taking confidence in you and uh, making sure they're getting the job done properly. Yep. All right, guys, thanks for uh, participating uh, and giving your advice on when you should hire an engineer. Um, that's going to wrap up our show. We got to go. We are, are over time, and there's folks that want to come in here after us. Hey, thanks a lot for listening and watching this week in Radio Tech. Got a quick prize giveaway. I'm going to spin the, the magic mention wheel. I promise not to look. The magic mention wheel on my iPad, <laughs> and, and uh, here we go. It landed on uh, the third retweet of the show uh, an hour ago, and that is from, uh, from Neil. goes by the Twitter handle of at on air traffic. Neil's from Toronto, Canada. At least that was, that's what he claims. Uh, Neil's an aspiring traffic reporter writing about transportation and driving with an extra serving of radio and TV traffic reporting. So, uh, Neil, congratulations. You have scored... Uh, your very own Omnia AXE. We will be in touch with you and uh, give you the license codes and all that stuff. We'll give you the launch codes and you can uh, you can launch it yourself and have a good time. Uh, check it out on the website at omniaaudio.com. Thanks a lot to uh, Telos, Omnia, and Axia for sponsoring this week's show of This Week in Radio Tech. Chris Tarr from McWanago, thanks for being with us. Appreciate you. Thanks for having me. Be sure to uh, check me out on Twitter at the Geek Jedi. Yes, the Geek Jedi. I do. I follow you everywhere. And also, uh, Chris Tobin from uh, Manhattan. Thanks, Chris, for being with us. <laughs> Thank you, Kirk. Have a good night, everyone. And Tom Ray from the Hudson Valley of New York and WOR. Thanks, Tom, for being with us as well. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. And, uh, hey, follow me on Twitter if you like, uh, at K Harnack, if you want to put up with my nonsense. We'll see you again next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody.